If you will, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 28, 18, and we're also going to look at Luke 24, and uh, we really verse 46 and following Luke 24, so we'll be looking at both of those. Jason said that um, I'm his favorite pastor or preacher, and I co-planted Sovereign Grace actually with Jason. Um, he's, he and I planted the church together, and he is also my favorite pastor. I will say that I'm incredibly thankful to follow Ian Hamilton, which sounds odd because most people following Ian Hamilton might feel a bit intimidated. I'm thankful because what I've found when Ian stands up here and proclaims the word is you don't think much about Ian, you think much about Christ. And um, when you get to stand up and preach after that, uh, you, you're, just, you're just thrilled to be able to open the word in that context. Um, let's read the text together. I need to put on my glasses. I'm, my wife keeps reminding me that, that death is encroaching quickly and these things are happening. <laughs> Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now look over at Luke 24. We'll start reading in verse 46, realizing Christ has just opened the scriptures and taught to them from the Old Testament, and said, it says this, verse 46, and said to them, that being Jesus said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You were witnesses of these things and behold I am sending the promise of my Father upon you but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Let's give thanks to the Lord for his word. Father, we pray that as we consider your word and what it is that the head of the church, our Lord Jesus Christ, has to say to us, that we would see um, the text of scripture, Matthew and Luke, for what it is, the word of the Lord, penned by Matthew and Luke, superintended by the Holy Spirit for the sake of the church in every age. So we ask that our Lord would speak to us by the Spirit and through the Word. We recognize that I'm a man and apart from your Spirit, the words that I speak will just fall to the ground. It is the powerful, present ministry of the Holy Spirit that drives these words into our hearts and minds, and we pray that he would be doing that. We pray that your son would be exalted, that we would look to him, and that we would desire to see him known where he is not. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, nearly 100 years ago, J. Gresham Machen was in a battle, a battle against growing liberalism in the Presbyterian Church USA, in Princeton, um, and in global missions. He actually wrote a book about this battle, uh, defending historic biblical Christianity called Christianity and Liberalism, distinguishing them as distinct religions. What was occurring at the time was that there was another gospel being taught. The resurrection of the Christ was being denied. That historicity of the resurrection was being jettisoned. And with it, the gospel was being turned into a, a kind of 
social justice sort of message. The church was becoming a society for social welfare, and the mission of the church became about doing good works around the world. We had lost a proper understanding of the gospel, of the church, and of the mission of the church. And Machen was devoutly committed to the biblical gospel message. Now, I want to be clear. He did not preach a new gospel message. He was merely reminding the church of what we had long held. Nearly 50 years ago, at the first Lausanne Conference, Congress, Ralph Winter gave a plenary address on unreached people groups. And that address became a kind of clarion call for many in the church to return to proclaiming the gospel message among those peoples and languages who had never heard. But Ralph Winter's call was not new. In fact, there were already organizations in existence who were doing that work before 1973, 74. For example, New Tribes Missions was around. Further, there had been men calling us to the same need to engage unreached peoples for centuries. Jonathan Master has a uh, session on the history of some of that in the Scottish Presbyterian world. However, Ralph Winter's call did ignite a kind of fire under many who had turned from this focus. And this morning, I'm hoping to look at both of these topics. What is the gospel? And to whom are we to proclaim it? Who are the nations? So first, I want to answer the question, what is the gospel that we're on mission to proclaim? And second, I want to answer the question, what is the scope of the gospel uh, preaching mission, if you will? What's the scope of it? To whom are we commanded to proclaim this message? As we consider these two aspects of Christ's, commissions, uh, Christ's commission to his church, I want to remind you that these topics are really tied together. They're intimately tied together. The gospel that we preach the work that Christ came and did is based upon promises God gave in the Old Testament. But God did not only give Old Testament promises with regard to the person of Christ and his work, God also gave Old Testament promises with regard to the scope of Christ's work, for whom he was coming. And these, so these topics are intimately tied together, and so we're going to look at both. What is the message? Well, the message is what we often you know, hear thrown around as these words, the gospel. The gospel merely means good news. And we hear that language thrown around. We use it in all sorts of ways in the church. There's the gospel coalition. There's together for the gospel. We talk about gospel-centered and gospel-shaped marriage and parenting and I'm soon waiting for the gospel-shaped plumbing book to come out. I don't know when that's coming, but we seem to like use it as an adjective we attach to everything. Pastors often throw around the word gospel without defining it, like I'm doing right now. People talk about living the gospel, sort of turning the gospel into a kind of law. We even hear the popular phrase attributed to uh, St. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel always, when necessary, use words. Utter nonsense. <laughs> or I hear people saying, the only gospel some people will ever see is your life. Oh my. <laughs> my life is not good news for anybody. <laughs> and neither is yours. If your life and my life are the hope of the world, the world is damned. <laughs> or we're Jesus with skin on. You know Jesus has skin. He is truly man and truly God. You are not him with skin on. Our lives are not the good news. If we want people to see Christ, 
Paul tells us how that's done in Galatians 3.1. We placard Christ. We picture him, we hold him up when we proclaim the gospel message. When we preach the good news. Now for the sake of time to define that message, I'm only going to consider our passage in Luke. So look at Luke 24, verses 46 and 47. Jesus gives us the grounding of the gospel in the Old Testament, and then he says this. He said to them, thus it is written, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Now I want you to notice two categories here, if you will. I'm gonna borrow them from Machen. Two categories, history and doctrine. First, Christ gives us the historical facts, if you will, of the gospel message. What are the historical facts of the gospel message? Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. The Christ, the Messiah promised in the Old Testament, should suffer. Now, in some sense, this can speak to the whole state of his humiliation from the incarnation um, to his death, but it is particularly here focused upon his atoning work on the cross. And on the third day, rise from the dead, speaking of his, his vindication, his exaltation as holy, innocent, and undefiled, the one who has put to death, death, who has conquered the grave. These are the historical facts of the gospel message. Christ lived, Christ died on the cross, Christ rose from the dead on the third day. The church has recited these historical facts in creeds like the Apostles' Creed for nearly two millennia. They drive at these same facts, the Apostles do, the Apostles drive at these same facts in every evangelistic sermon in the book of Acts. Now, if you want more on that, I'm not gonna prove that, I'm gonna show you one. If you want more on that, chapter six in the free book we just gave you. Jason just said the subtitle's all you need to read, but, and then you're done, right? Tells you the whole story. But chap, chapter six will get you more into that. Sorry, I'm giving him a hard time. Chap, look at Acts chapter 10, I'll look at one of them. Acts chapter 10. Let's just read verse 36 first. Paul has come to Cornelius. Maybe I should give, actually I'll start in verse 34. Let me give you this context really briefly. Paul comes to Cornelius, who's, or Paul, Paul, sorry, Peter comes to Cornelius. Now, now who is Cornelius to whom Peter's coming? Cornelius is a God-fearing Gentile. He was a centurion, he had donated Uh, to the Jewish synagogue. He's not a Jew. What's the question in someone like Cornelius' mind? Would God send the promised Messiah for Gentiles too? He's a Jewish Messiah. Would God send him for Gentiles too? So where does Peter begin? Verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Now listen to the facts about Jesus. Here he goes. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. What happened, verse 38? how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. And we are witnesses of these things. So first in 37, 38, you hear about Jesus' life and ministry. Now here comes his death and verse 39. And we are witnesses of all that he did both both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. Cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. 
Christ lived. He ministered. He did miracles. He taught. Christ became the curse for us in our place on the tree at Calvary. Next fact, verse 40. But God raised him on the, on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Christ rose from the dead bodily. He rose from the dead bodily. We ate and drank with him. We saw him. Paul will go on to tell us in 1 Corinthians 15 that over 500 people saw him. Now, Peter doesn't just preach the historical facts, though, when he preaches the gospel message. He also preaches what Machen will call the doctrine. The doctrine. Or it's Peter. I keep saying Paul. Peter. Peter preaches the doctrine. And this leads us to our second category of the gospel, the doctrine. Look at verse 42. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. We announce to the world that as the resurrected and ascended Lord who has been coronated king and taken his throne, Jesus is the judge of all the earth. All who remain in their sins stand condemned. We are born guilty and corrupt in Adam, and we are not only sinners by nature in that sense, we are sinners by choice. We have committed actual sin in our rebellion against God in our transgression of his law. And we will die physically and face the judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. And as the messianic king, Christ is the judge. But here's the good news. All who believe in Jesus receive forgiveness of sins through his name. See, I keep hearing this message that the gospel is that Christ is king and has a kingdom. Listen, that is not good news if you're his enemies. That is only good news if you've been reconciled to God through him. We can hear the reverberations of Psalm 2 here, can't we? Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. In preaching the message of the gospel, Peter is telling us how the historical facts of the gospel message apply to you and to me. Look, look at Luke 40, 24, 47. Luke 24, 47. I want to go back there because I want you to see that Peter is just doing what Jesus commanded. 24, 47. He said to them, we'll look at verse 46 first. He said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Note that Jesus did not say, he did not say, once you come across a guilt-ridden German monk in the 16th century, then start telling him he's guilty and he needs forgiveness because that's a Western imposition. That's popular to say today. Don't you know these uh, folks in the Near East, ancient Near East and, and then into the first century, Jews are largely going to be honor shame kind of folks or fear power kind of folks? What do you, nonsense. Those arguing for such models, moving away from penal substitutionary atonement, the fact that Christ stood in our place condemned for us, bore the wrath of the Father for us. Those who argue for such models as just being some kind of 
Western imposition on the text are, are bringing to you a false gospel. Now, I'll, I'll probably talk more about that next year. I want to keep going. Because that's becoming a pervasive problem in missions. This is the doctrine. Christ did all these works for you and your salvation. You were a sinner. Condemned in your sin. And Christ came. And he, as a man, was under the law. You remember Galatians 4. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of woman, of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. So under the law, condemned. Christ came, and in our place, he kept that law fully. He was tempted in every way, yet without sin. Christ went to the cross, and he bore the wrath of the Father for you and for me. For our law breaking, he took the penalty of our sin upon himself. He drank the cup of wrath in our place. And on the third day, he rose from the dead, conquering sin and death, conquering Satan. The grave was the just reward, if you will, for our sin. And Christ conquered it for us. So that we would be forgiven of our sins. We would be declared righteous in Christ. We would be adopted as God's children. We would rise from the dead with him and have eternal life. We just are to proclaim that message promiscuously to all nations, to make it known to everyone. And we don't just get these benefits. We get Jesus. We're proclaiming that Jesus is ours and we're his. And with him comes all his good gifts. So what's the scope of the Great Commission? What's the scope of it? You'll notice that the same phrase is used in both Matthew 28, 19 and Luke 24, 47. Since you're already in Luke 24, 47, just look there. This, is, this gospel is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. The Greek phrase, panta ta ethne, to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Look at Matthew 28, 19. 28, 19. Jesus has come and told them, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples, where? Of all nations, pantata ethne, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. In Greek, the phrase panta ta ethne is in both Matthew 28, 19 and Luke 24, 47. The only distinction is that in Luke, Jesus tells the apostles where this making of disciples is going to begin. It will begin in Jerusalem. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you at Pentecost, it will begin then and there. But what is meant by all nations. That's become the source of no little debate and the source of all manner of craziness. Before I answer this question, let me answer a more fundamental question. Why are we concerned with getting an answer to this question? And here's the simple answer. Because we want to fulfill the command Christ gave us. And there's much confusion about what's meant by this phrase, all nations. And we want to clear up the confusion so we can be obedient to the command. Now, you've probably heard rightly that we can translate this all people groups, all ethnes or, or peoples. And people groups, a term that has come to mean, as Brooks said yesterday, so many different things that it seems 
almost meaningless. What is it? What is it? We need some definition for it. What is it? Now, I want to be clear as I'm trying to define what a people group is or what Pantata ethne means, that we at Radius are not trying to come up with such a numerically precise set of parameters that we believe we can guarantee where the finish line is. We're not arrogant enough to believe that we are those who will finally, finally do what no church has done before and finish the task. We simply want to be those who are faithful to the task. So here's what you're not going to hear as a pitch. Well, there are 3,100 people groups. I, we would probably say there's 3,000, 3,100 people groups or so by the definition I'm going to give. There are 3,000, 3,100 people groups. Matthew 24, 14 says that the gospel must be preached to all nations, then the end will come. So here's what we need to do. Radius now has a strategy for you. 3,000 people groups, about eight missionaries per group for a team. So we need 24,000 missionaries uh, with a 50% attrition rate, maybe 48,000 missionaries. If Radius can get really aggressive and you can give us a bunch of your money, we can build enough facilities to maybe train 600 a year, 600 a year, and after 80 years, we'll be done. We'll force Jesus' hand and he'll come. That, that is not what we're trying to suggest. We're merely trying to ask, what has Christ commanded the church to do? And to whom has he commanded us to do that? How do we define that? That's what I'm gonna to attempt to get at. There are um, no exact, perfectly exact answers for me to give to this, but there are some un incomplete or unhelpful answers. For example, ethne is a reference to, or all nations a reference to the Gentiles only, over and against the Jews. Here's the problem. Preach this, to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Those would be Jews. I've got authority, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. I would assume that includes Jews, since he's the Lord of all the earth. All nations is another one that's thrown out as a reference to geopolitical states. So geopolitical states are the things, what we mean by that are things, you know, there are borders. So the United States used to have borders anyway, but there are borders. Somehow we're good at keeping the Canadians out, but not down below. So there are borders, right? And, and, uh, and there's some kind of a, of a government by which we define this thing. And I don't want you to think that the United States or France or Germany as geopolitical nations are excluded because Daniel 13 and, uh, 7, 13 and 14, when it says that uh, one like the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days and is given authority over every tribe and tongue and nation, etc., if you remember, the context there is following four sort of deformed beasts referencing nations, namely Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. We're also hearing some echoes here of Psalm 2, one of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament. Psalm 2, where... The Lord says, the Father, if you will, in, in, in my take, says to the Son, you are my Son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage. So we're not saying it's excluding geopolitical nations, but Israel was a nation for some time without ge uh, geographical borders or a formal government. They get one, we'll get to that in a minute. The other thing that we hear out there is that nations is a reference to, to affinity groups. It's likely the furthest potential definition for Pontetal ta ethne. What I mean by an affinity group. Here's the thing. You find some organizations that are going to list so many people groups, 16,000 unreached people groups, and they start defining those kinds of things, and you, you need to ask questions like, what, how, how are you defining a people group? What, what does that mean? What does that mean? So do all, you know, the women, unbelieving women who quilt in North Carolina become a people group? How do I know what that is? I was in Hawaii uh, for two weeks with my wife recently, and, and while there, I kept being told about how the, the surfing community in Hawaii is almost entirely unbelieving. 
almost entirely unbelieving. Is that a people group? If it is, I would like to be the missionary to the Hawaiian <laughs> surf community. That one sounds fantastic. Now listen, the church is, is responsible, the church in Hawaii is responsible to reach those unbelievers in the surfing community. But is that what Christ is referencing here? It's good, I wanna say this, it's good, required, that you reach the unbelievers around your church. You're commanded to do that. But is that fully what we mean by a people group or a nation? Now I've given you negative answers. Am I able to arrive at any constructive definition of what Jesus means by this? I think we are able to arrive there at who the Pontata ethne are. And I don't want you to forget that our first point of what is the gospel is tied to this question, what does Jesus mean by all the nations? Because the history and doctrine of Christ that we're commanded to proclaim is the fulfillment of Christ's promised mission in the Old Testament. And that mission not only speaks, that's promised in the Old Testament, not only speaks to a person and a work, but it speaks to a people for whom he's doing that work for whom he's coming. But to ground this, look at Luke 24, 44. Luke 24, 44. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. That's a summary of the Old Testament. Everything written about me there in the Old Testament must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. This gospel message about the person and work of Jesus Christ was promised in the Old Testament. And so I think we can get our definition not only about the gospel in the Old Testament, which I'm not gonna take time to do, but about what he meant by all the nations in the Old Testament because the people for whom he was coming are discussed in the Old Testament as well. Where should we begin in the Old Testament then? Well, let's follow the lead of Jesus. Look up at Luke 24, 25. Jesus comes to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. These two men, remarkable passage. Here's the resurrected Christ um, appeared to them. Jesus doesn't think, man, they're depressed. They know I was crucified. They could probably use a sighting of me right now. Instead, um, as the good shepherd he is, he knows they need to hear the word of God and opens the scriptures to them. He appears to them at the end of that, and then they, they reflect. Did not our hearts burn within us when Christ appeared to us resurrected? It's not what they said. When he opened to us the scriptures. But look at what happens here in verse 25. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So let's begin defining all the nations where Jesus began defining it. Let's begin with Moses. That grounds the person and work of Christ and for whom he's come. Let's see if Moses can give us an answer to what Jesus means by all the nations. Turn with me, if you will, to Genesis 12. Kevin turned us here yesterday. I want to go back here for a moment. As you're turning to Genesis 12, I, I really want to set this up. If you remember Genesis 1, we, we hear about the six days of God's creation. That's laid out for us, and on the seventh day, he rests. When we come into Genesis 2, we're not just hearing about the God who created all things and what he created and saw that it was all good, uh, but we're, we're hearing about... Um, a, a focus really on, on Adam and then Eve, and specifically on the covenant that God makes with Adam there in the garden. You can eat of every tree, but you shall not eat of the tree in the middle of the garden. You eat of that tree, and you'll die. Well, in Genesis 3, we come to the chapter where we recognize that Adam and Eve listened to the serpent Eve being deceived, Adam rebelling along with her. 
And they eat of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. And then we read about God coming to curse them. And we read of the curse of death that comes upon them and all the fallout from their sin. What's interesting is that from Genesis 3 through Genesis 11, you hear God curse man five times. Five times. When you open up Genesis 12 and Abraham comes along, I, I, I want you to gather this because from the world I used to come to, you come to Genesis 12 through 15, it's like, Genesis 1 through 11, about creation and the fall and the global stuff, and then once you get to Genesis 12, it's all about Israel, baby. That's all we're talking about from now on. As if somehow Israel just falls in here and is completely disconnected from what's come before in the first 11 chapters. But what I want you to understand is when God comes to Abram, he blesses him five times. He gives that word of blessing five times. And we're starting to hear that what's happening in Genesis 12 and following in Abraham is actually the answer to the problem that we are reading about in Genesis 3 through 11 in the whole of the world. So look what it says. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you, now catch this, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the term I wanted to come to. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Pick up verse seven. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to them. Now I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. But I want you to pick up this language. All the families of the earth shall be blessed in Abraham and what you're starting to learn in verse seven, and in his offspring. In Abraham and his offspring. Now go to Genesis 18. Genesis 18. And look at verse 18. You know this passage. Um, Abraham has just received the sign of the covenant and circumcision and been renamed from Abram to Abraham as the father of many nations. And now interestingly, as God tells Abraham, the father of many nations, who's to be a blessing to the nations, who God, through whom God will bless the nations, as he tells him he's gonna curse um, and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham begins to intercede for them. And God says this, though, to Abraham. Look at verse 17. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Isn't that interesting? Abraham's people are gonna become a nation, his family will become a nation, and all the, pe all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. What was it in Genesis 12, three that we blessed in Abraham and his offspring? All the families of the earth. Now in Genesis 18, 18, all the nations of the earth. Incidentally, Paul, in Galatians 3, verse 8, elides Genesis 18, 18 and Genesis 12, 3. When he quotes from Genesis 12, 3 and says that um, the gospel was preached beforehand, beforehand to Abraham, he says, in you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. He elides that. In other words, he interchanges the word families of the earth with the word nations following the pattern we're seeing in Genesis with 12, Genesis 12, 3 and Genesis 18, 18. But look at Genesis 22, 18. This is the scene where Abraham is at Mount Moriah, the mountain where the Lord will provide, or on the mountain, can also be translated, on the mountain he will be seen. Fascinating. Um, won't get into that now, though. But on this mountain where Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac and God provides a goat in his place, Look at what we read there about Abraham's offspring, 22, and in, um, let's read verse 17, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heavens, and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Look at Genesis 26 and verse four. 
The promise is to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and so we hear it passed to Isaac. Genesis 26 and verse 4, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands, and in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. He's going to come back and talk about what he did with Abraham. Now go to Genesis 28, 14. Now to Jacob, Jacob's dream. Look at verse 14. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and your offspring shall all the what? Families of the earth be blessed. Families of the earth and nations are terms that are used interchangeably. Now who is this seed or offspring of Abraham who will possess the gates of his enemies and who will bless all the families of the earth or all the nations of the earth? Well, that seed of Abraham is the Messiah, the Christ. He is the serpent crushing seed of the woman promised in Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15, you remember it? When God curses the serpent and before he gets about cursing Adam and Eve after their wicked rebellion, the first thing they hear as he curses the serpent is that a gospel is coming for them. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head, you will bruise his heel. This mother promise from which all the other promises with regard to the Christ of Scripture are born. He's going to come through the woman. He will be truly human. But we learn with Abraham, he's not just coming from humanity. He's coming from Israel. Genesis 12, 15, 17, and 22. He's coming from Israel. We learn in Genesis 49, 8 through 10, that the scepter shall not depart from Judah. So he's not just coming through humanity, through Israel. Now we have it narrowed down to a tribe, the tribe of Judah. We learn in 2 Samuel chapter 7, particularly verses 13 and 14, that he's coming from the house of David. And the promise of the Messiah continually narrows until he comes and the Gospel of Matthew opens up talking about the Gospel of Jesus Christ and says, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The promise of the seed of the woman, the Christ, the Savior is being narrowed throughout the Old Testament until he comes. And to whom is he coming to bless? For whom is he coming? Who will he save? All the families of of the earth, all the nations. He has promised to a fallen, corrupted, guilty, dying, and condemned world. And condemned world. In Abraham's seed, the seed of the woman, the Messiah, the only mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, in him. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. And thus, all those who believe in Christ among all the nations, all the families of the earth, will be Abraham's children, for Abraham is the father of many nations. So if anyone is in Christ, he is a child of Abraham. So I've largely established that all the families of the earth and all the nations are interchangeable, but I've really not answered my question. I've just added a term. Great, we had all the nations all the peoples, and now we have all the families of the earth. What does that mean? What's meant by a family of the earth or a nation? Well, a family here seems to be something significant enough to also use the socio-political language of nation with them. So Israel is a family clan of tribes or people who multiply into a much larger nation at the beginning of Exodus. But Israel does not have a geography at the beginning of Exodus. They have a promised one, but they don't yet have borders. They do, however, share a common language and culture and ethnic heritage. In other words, they have the same genealogy, if you will, and they're arranged into tribes. But they exist as a people or a nation, which, by the way, are also interchangeable terms. As a people or a nation, they exist that way inside of Egypt at first. Also interchangeable, how do I know that? Because in Psalm 96, verses 3 and 7, 
people and nation are interchanged. But they do not yet have their own borders. That comes in Joshua. They do not yet have their own government. That comes with the Mosaic Covenant. But they share a language and culture. They share a family history or genealogy. And they are a people or a nation or a family of the earth. So language, culture, and family heritage or genealogy is primarily what marks them off as a nation. Now, I want to confirm that in Genesis. Because you might say, well, that sounds nice, but can you prove it to us? Look at Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. That will, by the way, God will promise Abraham that he will make a name for him. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. It's humorous. They build the tower up to the heavens in their minds, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have one language. And this is the only the beginning of what they will do. They are one people who share one language. And this is the only beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. The Lord separated them them into the families of the earth or the nations of the earth by confusing their languages and then scattering them across the earth. And we see that played out in the genealogy of Genesis 10. I don't have time to set this up, but Genesis is arranged around genealogies, and what you usually get is genealogy, narrative. Genealogy, narrative. Genealogy, narrative. So you get the genealogy of of Adam via Seth in Genesis 5, and then 6, 1 through 8, you get the narrative of how wicked the earth has become. In Genesis 6, 9, you get a genealogy of Noah picked up, and then you get the story of the flood. In Genesis 10, you get the genealogy of all the peoples of the earth through the three sons of Noah, and then you get the narrative of the Tower of Babel. But the Tower of Babel actually, historically, if you will, comes before Genesis 10 in the sense that you see the consequence of Genesis 11 played out in the genealogy in Genesis 10. So look there. But the generations of Noah, Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, etc., of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Look first at the sons of Japheth, Genesis chapter 10, and look at verse 5. Verse 5. And I want you to notice the apposition between words clans, languages, nations, and people. From these, the coastland peoples spread in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans in their nations. The sons of Ham, go down to verse 20. These are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. Go to verse 31, we'll see with Shem, from which Abram comes. These are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. These are the clans of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies in their nations, and from these the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Now please catch this. What is the primary distinguishing mark common to each family or nation? Distinct languages. Distinct languages. They all had one language. They sinned. God separated them into separate families of earth and nations on the basis primarily of language. They do have same family heritage, if you will, on the basis of language. It seems that then the families of the earth is tied to clans that form some sort of socio-political bond and share a common language and potentially land. That's why you hear language like you do in the prophets. Isaiah 66, 18, for I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, languages, and they shall come and see my glory. 
Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. And this is what undergirds or what grounds the language of Ponta Ta Ethne in the commission Christ is giving to his church. I came to fulfill the promise given to, given to Abraham and his offspring because who is that offspring according to Galatians? The Christ. And I've come to fulfill that in saving all the nations. Go tell them. To believe in me. This is why when the Holy Spirit is poured out at Pentecost, every nation present is hearing the wonderful works of the Lord in their own what? Language. And as Christ, what's happening here? Christ has ascended to heaven, having completed his work on our behalf, presented his atoning sacrifice before the Father, and sat down on his throne as king and poured out the Holy Spirit, beginning a new creation in Christ. And the beginning of that new creation, at the very outset, we see the beginning of the reversal of battle. This is the beginning of the new creation age in Christ. That's why in John's apocalyptic vision, he said, after this, I looked and behold, I saw a great multitude that could, no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This helps us define the scope of the Great Commission. We need to make Christ known in every people group, in every nation, in every family of the earth, and the most fundamental way of distinguishing those groups is by a common language, culture, and heritage that they share. Brothers and sisters, as best we can discern, there are over 3,000 of these groups that presently have zero gospel witness among them. They have no church, no missionary, no Bible, nothing, nothing. These peoples, these nations, have no hope of salvation. They're condemned in their sins without any good news. Will we go to them? Will we go to them? We have the greatest news that could ever be known. We know it. Someone crossed land and sea and bothered to learn our language so that we might hear the good news. How can we not want to go to the mountains and shout it to the ends of the earth? Jesus is Lord. Jesus has saved me. He will save you if you look to him. Will we support people who'll go? Will we pray for these nations and for the people whom we send? Will we stop fooling about with all the distractions? You know, I don't want to say my church building committee is a distraction because I do think it's good that we're going to build a building. But the first time we went through a building process, my church was planted 16 years ago. We have nearly 500 people, and we still set up and tear down every Sunday. We meet in three different locations. I think now in 16 years we've met in 14 locations. We are the hardest church in our city to find. You almost need a secret password because you don't know where we're going to be. And we had a building committee. We have land. We have two different pieces of land. Plenty of land. People who would like a building. And in 2016, our building committee came to the elders and said, you know what? We have a whole series of missionaries we want to send to the ends of the earth. Um, as much as this building sounds attractive to all of us, we think we should put all our money into sending them. We can set up and tear down so that these people can know Christ. Now, I'm not saying we won't build a building. We still hope to. Still hope to, because we're in California, and the government keeps kicking us out of buildings. So we'd like to own one. <laughs> so they can't do it. 
But people worked diligently and sacrificed and suffered so we'd hear the gospel in our own language. And people need to hear this message. May the Holy Spirit shed the love of God abroad in our hearts and may the love of Christ compel us to go and make him known to fulfill all that the Lord Jesus has commanded to his church. May we be obedient. Let me pray. Father, we're thankful for Christ, for the salvation we know in him, and we pray that we would not take for granted that someone worked diligently and suffered, someone appointed by your Son, ordained, sent by the Holy Spirit through the church, came and learned our language and proclaimed the gospel to us. And now we know Christ, and may we likewise go and make him known to those who have not had, have not heard such good news. We pray that your spirit would work powerfully in us to that end. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.